the Policy Council for the National Congress of American Indians. And thank you so much for spending some time with us this afternoon for part two of our webinar series on the Tribal Resource Tool, where we're looking at the journey to serve and expand services to American Indians and Alaska Native victims of crime in the digital world. Now, for those of you who missed our first webinar yesterday, don't worry. The NCVC communications team will be compiling all of the materials, links, recordings, slides, and sending them out to everyone that's registered for our webinar today. Um, I'd love it if we did something that we did yesterday, which was uh, if you would please put in the chat box your name, where you're calling in from, perhaps the service that you work for. It was fantastic to see all of the people from across Indian country and where you're dialing in from. And we had a really great dialogue and we would love to keep that up today. So please come see us in the chat box. Now, we all know that American Indians and Alaska Natives have the highest crime rate victimization rates in the nation, but they often have difficulty connecting with these services that exist to help them recover from crime and abuse. Today, we're gonna to talk about in detail how you can use the Tribal Resource Tool, or the TRP, to access a map of over 900 resources for American Indian and Alaska Native victims of crime and survivors. Now, we shared with you yesterday that during the reporting period from January 2020 to June 2020, the TRP was actually utilized more than 600 times every single month totaling over 3,900 searches in six months. And that's fantastic, and we want people to keep using the tool. Now, the initiative for the Tribal Resource Tool is an Office of Victims of Crime uh, initiative, and the TRT provides information on victim services via searchable database. And all you have to do is visit the TRT website, which we'll include here in the chat in just a second. By visiting the TRT website, you will find services and providers that may help American Indian and Alaska Natives recover from crime and abuse by providing a broad array of wraparound resource information. And this includes everything from law enforcement, to mental health providers, medical services, crisis response, shelters, advocacy groups, and so on. Now, during yesterday's webinar, we met our entire team and we covered the history of the tribal resource tool, including how stakeholders shape the tool to what it has become today. Now, today we're gonna to look at the value of and importance of collaboration on the tool and making sure that we're sharing information to reach broad audiences of service providers. Now, our presentation is going to take three important topics. So first, Renee Bork will walk us through how to actually use the Tribal Resource Tool to help American Indian and Alaska Native victims and survivors that you may be assisting on a regular basis. After Renee, Glenn evans Lomayesa will walk us through the three reports coming out of the National Congress of American Indians and the important information included in those reports. Finally, Renee will talk to us about what's the future of the Tribal Resource Tool and how, what we can expect next. Uh, finally, for those of you who were here yesterday, we had a great Q&A session at the, end of, at the end of the webinar. Feel free to use the question and answer section in Zoom. Um, we're happy to answer your questions via chat. We will also have a set amount of time at the end of the um, webinar today to actually answer questions. So put them in the Q&A section, put them in the chat in general, or you can send them to me, Kelby Kennedy, individually. And what I will do is I will put them all in a Word document and we will walk through them with a larger team. Speaking of the larger team, I'm going to turn it over to a couple of our partners to reintroduce themselves today. Um, first with Heather Torres uh, to talk about the uh, Tribal Law and Policy Institute. Heather? Hello, everyone. Uh, for those joining us again today, thank you so much. Good to see, good to be with you all again today. Uh, for those who didn't get to hear from me yesterday, my name is Heather Torres. I am a citizen of San Alfonso Pueblo and a descendant of the Navajo Nation. And I serve as the program director for the Tribal Law and Policy Institute, or in short, TLPI. Um, and TLPI is part of the team to support the development and the population of the tribal resource tool. And today I'll be mostly helping to monitor the chat and make sure that we're getting to all of your wonderful questions. So thank you so much for joining us. And I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Abby. Hi, everyone. This is Abby Thonis from the Tribal Law and Policy Institute. I work with Heather and Bonnie, who is not able to join us today. And I assist on the outreach and entry of programs into the Tribal Resource Tool from the TLPI side. And as Heather and Kelby both said before me, thank you all for joining us today. Hi, everyone. A uh, quick introduction for me. My name is Gwen Evans-Lomiesa. 
I am Hopi, and I am a researcher with the National Congress of American Indians Policy Research Center. And you'll hear more from me later. Thanks so much, Gwen. So I'm going to introduce our first speaker for today, Renee Bork. Uh, Renee is a citizen of the Muskogee Creek Nation of Oklahoma, and she serves as the program manager for the tribal resource tool out of the National Center for Victims of Crime. Renee previously served as a supervisory victim specialist in the Bureau of Indian Affairs Office of Justice Services in Great Plains Region District 1, overseeing the BIA OJS District 1 Victim Assistance Program throughout North and South Dakota and Nebraska. Renee has held previous positions as a sworn police officer in Oklahoma, both at the tribal level and at the state level, a tribal domestic violence sexual assault advocate as well. Renee is a contract adjunct instructor with the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center and has traveled across the nation to provide training and technical assistance to law enforcement agencies regarding victims' issues. Renee has over 16 years of experience dealing with victims of crime in Indian country, working on several different reservations, including Oklahoma's complex checkerboard jurisdiction. She's had extensive knowledge and experience in assisting victims of violent crimes with an emphasis on crimes of, against women and children in both tribal, state, and federal court settings. Renee's experience as an advocate and law enforcement officer provides her a unique perspective on systems of response in addressing victims' needs. Renee hopes to use her experience and perspectives to raise awareness of the unique issues facing Indian country today. Renee holds a Bachelor's of Science degree in Criminal Justice from St. Gregory's University in Shawnee, Oklahoma, and a Master's of Science degree in Human Resources focusing on criminal justice from East Central University in Ada, Oklahoma. Renee has worked on projects such as the Maze, and, Maze of Injustice with Amnesty International and has been one of the leading voices for Native victims in Oklahoma. Renee has held several different positions on many different communities and national boards and has also received a letter of acknowledgement from the South Dakota United States Attorney's Office for work conducted on the Pine Ridge Reservation. One of her highlights in her career is to receive an honorary ceremony from the Oglala Sioux Tribal Prosecutor, Caitlin Means of the Oglala Lakota Children's Justice Center for service to victims on the Pine Ridge Reservation. Additionally, I would just like to add that Renee has been recently appointed to be on her Tribal Nation's uh, Reservation Protection Commission, so for the Muskogee Creek Nation, which is very exciting. Uh, Renee has been a fantastic partner in this project and cares so much about the Tribal Resource Tool. I personally think her passion and experience show in her work in the Tribal Resource Tool and especially on how we've been able to increase the amount of uh, uh, particular services in the tool. Renee's going to do a great job today walking us through how we can actually use the tool and utilize the website to help victims of crime and survivors out in the Indian country today. Renee, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Kelby. Your introductions are always so wonderful. I appreciate that so much. Um, <laughs> thank you, everybody, for being here and investing your time and uh, for to investing your time this afternoon to share with us uh, yesterday and today. And just like Kelby had mentioned, our comms team is going to pull together all the resources, um, the slides, the recording, um, additional links, and we'll provide that to all the registrants um, after the webinars are concluded. So be on the lookout for that. And if time goes by and you miss it, just shoot us an email and we'll make sure that you get that information. Um, the National Center for Victims of Crime is the grantee, the OVC grantee for the Tribal Resource Tool, which we will refer to throughout today as the TRT. Um, you'll hear that quite often. Uh, we, the National Center for Victims of Crime is a national leading resource and advocacy organization for crime victim survivors and those who serve them. And we are the host agency for the Tribal Resource Tool. If you have any questions, put them in the Q&A or the chat box, and one of our te wonderful team members will make sure that they get those answered for you. So today, uh, next slide, please. I forget that I have to do that. So today, we're going to talk about the overview of the, the, overview of the actual tool. Um, we're going to talk about the, the victim services and how they're searchable and how you can search for specific services, um, your geographic location, um, crime type, 
age, gender. So we're going to look at uh, a different array of services that you can find um, by searching in two different mechanisms to search. Uh, the TRT also is going to help identify gaps in services in Indian country um, so that we can address that and enhance that and use that in the future for providing uh, hopefully funding resources for you know viable um, organizations and tribal communities. Next slide, please. So the tribal resource tool is twofold. Um, I, like I said, we're going to identify the gaps in services so that those can be addressed with the NCAI's um, gaps analysis report that Gwen will talk about later. And then also, we're going to focus in detail on using the tool today. Um, and you will see that we have over nine, I think I checked this morning, it was 932 resources are in the tool. And I'm, I still have several to vet, to vet through. So I hope, hopefully by the end of next week, we'll have close to 960. Um, and again, it's going to search, as you can see here on the screen, this is gonna be what the front page, search page looks like. And I'm constantly pointing with my finger at the screen, this is, this this webinar virtual stuff is all new to all of us, but you can see where it says South Dakota, USA. If you were going to search by a state, that's where you would put in um, your location. If you have your location services on, and that's a personal choice, um, I don't recommend that for victims, but most people may not know how to disable that on their laptop, but it will default to your um, location if you're location services are turned on. And it will search in a 200 mile radius. And as you can see underneath, you'll be able to search crime types, gender served, services provided, and ages served. And this is still a work in progress. So we're still sorting out, adding, editing, um, you know, different crime types, updating what, where we can. Um, so just keep that in mind as we go through this. Next slide, please. So we have a um, crime, we have a National Center for Victims of Crime uh, COVID-19 Facebook page. If anybody would be interested in that, we could probably put the link in the chat box. But we've utilized this as a means for service providers, um, all kinds of service providers, to just connect during COVID and look for different resources since we're all facing this new normal. And this was one of the um, comments that came up, as you can see, at the end of August, and it was somebody looking for services in Minneapolis, so, or Minnesota. And H Heather with TLPI jumped on and said, um, you know, try searching the tribal resource tool because this page isn't monitored um, 24 hours a day, and we have that disclaimer on there. But this was an excellent, I did get a message from this person and they were able to locate a ton of resources through the tribal resource tool by using, uh, using the, the link. So that was one example of how the tribal resource tool is being used today and we were like super proud of that. Next slide, please. So like I said, the history, we went over that in detail yesterday and the National Center for Victims of Crime project partners are the National Congress of American Indians and the Tribal Law and Policy Institute. And we also partnered with the Strong Hearts Native Helpline, and they assisted us earlier on with populating the tool and helping us try to navigate how to, you know, work through an online tool. Um, because the Strong, Light, Strong Hearts Helpline has been in existence for a few years now. So they've already kind of, you know, gone over those bumps and bruises, if you will. Um, we ask that everybody jump on the TRT website. And I believe that Heather put the link um, in the chat box, but it's also right here on the page. It's tribalresourcetool.org. Um, feel free to get in there and look around. There's an inclusion form where you can put your own information in, get familiar with it. Um, I think once people really get in there and start looking at the resources that we have, um, it becomes a saved page um, on your, your web, web history. 
Uh, let's see, yesterday Bonnie emphasized the value and the importance of the collaboration and just um, from myself today, I cannot thank my colleagues enough. I think this is absolutely one of the best partnerships, um, collaborations that I've ever had professionally working with different entities. And um, anyway, they've just been a great group of of folks to work with and uh, I'm going to miss them <laughs> when when we finish this project but I can't thank them enough and we're only successful because we all have worked so well together. Next slide please. Um, yesterday you may have if you were on yesterday you may you may not have heard this but if you were on yesterday you heard the history of the stakeholders and uh, Miss Bonnie Claremont who we consider to be our historian um, for the tribal resource tool. She uh, was able to tell the story of what this, which stakeholders were there from the very beginning, um, what specific information they wanted to see, the hopes and dreams they had for the tool, um, the things that they did not want entered in the tool, and they took that information to heart when when developing the, the website, making sure that we were modeling this exactly the way that it was actually going to benefit all communities, you know, not just one size fits all, which we know we can never do in Indian country. So the stakeholders input was instrumental and actually that is a huge part of the success of why this tool has been so helpful. Next slide, please. So the outreach to populate the tool has been very time intensive. Uh, we spend, and I can't thank Abby enough um, from TLPI and Heather also, but Abby and I work um, together on a daily basis, contacting you know, people inside the tool, contacting programs, emailing, following up phone calls, leaving voicemail messages. Uh, we're really good at bugging people to, you know, people that say, oh yeah, I wanna get in that tool, but I understand in this, this line of work, we're all busy. So we have no problem helping to follow up to remind you um, about getting your program in. And we've also sent um, email a hard copy of the inclusion form. And, you know, and I can do that also after this webinar if you reach out to me, but uh, we send this hard copy for those that are really busy or may have, I've had people that have internet who it drags really bad right now in their communities. And so it's easier for me to send them the hard copy form and they can fill it out and then they scan it, email it back to me. We'll enter the information for you. And then I send you an email telling you that it's entered. Please jump and I'll send the link and say jump onto your information and make sure everything's correct. Um, so that's, that's another mechanism that we could uh, use here today if anybody needed assistance getting their program entered. Um, like I said, we had 900, 931 programs this morning. Um, I hope, we hope to see that grow over the next three months um, because OVC has assured us that they're going to maintain this resource after our grant ends in December. So we've got three months to really beef it up. And I can remember at the beginning, as I'm sure my colleagues can, when we would have our calls and I would say, I think when I first started, there were 133 programs in the tool. And I would say, okay, y'all, I have a goal for 300 by the end of this time. And it was just mind blowing last month or the end of last quarter to say, my goal is to hit a thousand by September. And we're real close, we're really close. So um, yeah, great work done by everybody. So proud of everybody. Next slide, please. Um, this is the main page here that you would log on to and you can see at the top line, we have an escape button. If there, you know, if a victim is, as especially right now with COVID, isolated at home with an abuser, uh, they would be able to escape out and it clears the browser. So we have implemented that part. Um, you can see where there's a home about the project, resources, provider inclusion, contact us, and then of course the magnifying glass. So there's gonna be a couple of different ways that we can search through this to find resources. Um, let's see, okay, next slide please. 
So the tribal resource tool provides information on victim services via searchable database. Um, all you have to do is visit the website. You can do it from a laptop, a desktop, your smartphone, iPad, um, pretty much you know, any way you can get on the internet nowadays. Um, you're going to find services and providers that may help American Indian, Alaska Native ind individuals recover from crime and abuse by providing a broad array of services that we uh, talked about that Kelby mentioned this, this earlier. And the TRT is also going to help identify the gaps in services. And we're already finding out some information about that through Gwen's work, which I'm really excited for her to talk about. Next slide, please. So we'll do a quick case scenario. Um, this is hypothetical and uh, we'll run through uh, the tool a little bit so I can just show you how somebody, a service provider, a victim, a family member, you know, can easily navigate this to find services. So let's say that you're a victim service provider who needs to provide services to domestic violence victim. So you've identified the location and the tribal affiliation upon first contact. Um, so if somebody has contacted you and said, I'm Muskogee Creek from Oklahoma, but I live on the Fort, Fort Berthold Reservation of the three affiliated tribes in North Dakota, and I've got to get out and go to shelter, and I want to go home, but I can't go home until I get this protection order, because if I go home, he won't get served. Um, so that's, that's what we're looking at. So how could the tribal resource tool help you find these resources? Next slide, please. So our first and foremost as a service provider, obviously is gonna be the safety needs and support. That's gonna be first and foremost. Um, and, and I'm not gonna go into all detail on this because we're just gonna use this for just case scenario purposes, but there's gonna be two mechanisms that you can search for. And I've already talked about the map and the default location. And then you can also search with the magnifying glass to, um, to find something more specific. So we're going to use the magnifying glass and we're going to search by location of where I may know where some services are. So next slide, please. So you can click the magnifying glass and I know she's at the three affiliated tribes reservation, um, the MHA nation. So I'm just gonna put in three and I'm gonna hit enter. And then a list will pop up, as you can see on the right on the right side. So we get three programs that pop up just at the beginning. And there is an unlimited number of programs that will pop up. I think there's 10 or 15 at a time, and you just hit the load more button, and it will can you continue to load until you've exhausted all the resources in that alphabet or with that word. Um, so for this for this portion, I just screenshot the three. And of course, three affiliated tribes victim services comes up. So I'm going to select three affiliated tribes victim services. Next slide, please. So I'm going to click on, on the three affiliated tribes or TAT for short, they call themselves TAT. Um, and this is gonna give me all of the information I need to contact um, victim services for this victim and I know you can't see it all on this when it cut off on this screen, but where it says crime type served, um, domestic violence, intimate partner is listed. And below that is um, crimes or services, and it does have shelter. So that tells me that I can contact this agency for this victim, connect connect this victim with this agency, and she's going to be able to get to shelter immediately, which was her first concern. Um, and I would probably myself as a victim service provider contact um, the organization myself and make sure that I, you know, make sure that this is what the victim needs. Is this going to be something that you can provide and then connect them with the victim? Um, and that's just comes from my experience as a service provider. So this organization is going to be able to provide the immediate needs that we need for this victim in the immediate area of where she is. Next slide, please. So this would be if I was going to search the South Dakota area because this is where this is where our victim is right now. And I'm sorry, I got to look at my slides real quick. And I think that one got mixed up. So you can go to the next one. <laughs> so 
Okay, so I, I talked a little bit about um, in the beginning that I identified the immediate safety needs, safety concerns, but I also identified tribal affiliation. And I think sometimes this is where there's kind of a gap with folks who may not serve natives, um, you know, on a regular basis, but tribal affiliation is extremely important to us as native people. Um, it is very important that I am recognized as a Native American woman, but more so as a Muscogee woman. Um, that's just, that's very important to all tribal people, I think. So I know that this victim wants to relocate. Um, because that's what she told me. She wants to relocate after she gets her protection order in place. So I, you know, ask her, you know, her tribal affiliation, she was Muscogee Creek, and asked her where she was from, and she said that her tribe was located in Okmulgee, Oklahoma. So I punch in Okmulgee, Oklahoma, and hit enter. Next slide, please. I think that's a duplicate, <laughs> okay. And it's going to bring up several um, programs within that area, within the 200 mile range of Okmulgee, Oklahoma. But she told me she was Muscogee Creek. And so the second thing that comes up is the Muscogee Creek Nation Family Violence Prevention Program. So that's the program I'm going to contact and I'm going to tell them about, um, you know, there's a victim here who may want to relocate. Can I connect you with the three affiliated victim services so you two can coordinate, um, you know, meeting this victim's needs? Or I may just search this, and when I talk to the three affiliated victim service provider, I may go ahead and tell her. She advised me that she was um, a citizen of the Muscogee Creek Nation, and I found their information on the tribal resource tool, and here's their contact information because she is wanting to go home. And that is what we would call having a trauma-informed approach um, and being victim-centered because we were meeting all of the victim's needs um, with just a few clicks of a button, hopefully. Um, we would at least have the information to try to meet those needs. Next slide, please. So communication with service providers is extremely important. And if you work in the victim services field, which I'm assuming the majority of you online today do in some capacity, um, I mean, that's like an information, that's an information hotline highway within the advocate world. Um, and when we're working with service providers, I think the most of, most of us know that we need to address the immediate safety and health concerns. Um, and if somebody doesn't know that, then I feel like it's our job, especially if somebody's going to utilize this, a family member, community member, that we ensure that people understand that, that that's the first need that needs to be met. Um, we contact programs and resources uh, that we feel like they may need or that's going to be helpful to them. Uh, we try to connect the victim with an advocate um, because I don't, I don't like to have victims searching information for themselves if they, you know, they've got enough to deal with. And, you know, relaying that information back to a victim's tribe, their homelands, um, is, again, that's a trauma-informed approach to make sure that we're, you know, getting the victim everything that they possibly, possibly could need right now in their healing. Um, Let's see. And if you can just provide this resource or this website to all service programs that you work with and, you know, they can look through the criteria eligibility to see if they're eligible to be entered, because the more programs you have, the more resources we have at our fingertips, the better off we're going to be able to serve our victims. Next slide, please. So during, from January to June, through that reporting period, um, the tribal resource tool was utilized more than 600 times per month, um, totaling 3,930 searches in six months. And I honestly think that if it wasn't for COVID, that number probably would have been a lot higher because I think that victims, well, we, we've, we're finding that out now through a lot of agencies and surveys that, you know, victims were limited to access um, online resources due to just being confined, you know, with their abusers. So, you know, it was a safety concern to reach out and get services. But I still think that that's, that's a wonderful number to know that this tool um, was accessed that many times in hopes of serving, you know, that many victims. 
Um, and as the tools use more and more, the word of mouth travels throughout Indian country, giving the tool credibility. Um, I have had several really good um, feedback and examples of folks using the tool, and not, not just for serving victims, but for people who, you know, just are needing to network or they're looking for somebody to come speak about you know, a specific issue or in a specific area. I have had um, colleagues who've gone into the tool and they needed a speaker from the Northern Cheyenne Reservation. And they couldn't find anybody that knew anybody specifically that was gonna be able to do it because of COVID. So they were able to just get in the tool and they started searching around and they were able to locate somebody that could help them with some, uh, it was a webinar they were doing, a victim service webinar. So they were, they were able to network with some other victim service providers in the tool. So I see it's being used for a lot of things, which is really great. Next slide, please. So here's a quick state by state analysis. And so what we did was we put the states with the largest native population per capita. Um, I look for this to change with the census, of course, but this is what we have. And then the number of programs in TRT. So you have, as you see, we have number, Alaska's number one with the largest native per capita, but they're number six, or the number five in the TRT with 64 resources. Um, so you can go down here and see that correlation. Now, California is number three in TRT, but they weren't one of the top 10 of the largest native population per capita. And then Minnesota is number nine in TRT. But I thought this was a really interesting um, a view of who's, who's in, we can look at this and say, I know there's more tribal programs in say North Dakota than this amount. So we need to focus some outreach efforts in North Dakota, if that makes sense. And of course me being from Oklahoma and Gail being from South Dakota, um, we're constantly battling. So South Dakota, is number one in the TRT with 85 resources and Oklahoma is number two with 77. So not too long ago that was flipped. So I've got some work to do to catch up with South Dakota it looks like. Next slide please. So how do you get entered into the TRT? So we go back to the main page and we have two big red buttons and one is to go to the map and one is to complete the provider inclusion form. So if you want to get entered online, um, you just click that button. Next slide, please. And the first thing it's going to do, it's going to take you to the eligibility criteria page. And each plus sign out here to the right will expand um, on these questions and give you the information. Basically, if you provide a service to a to Native American or American Indian Alaska Native population, whether it be urban, reservation, whether it be adjacent to a reservation, um, if you serve Native people, you're going to meet the criteria. So you do not have to be a tribal program. You do not have to be a tribal affiliated program. You just need to be able to uh, provide a service to Natives. Um, so a perfect example would be IHS. They are a federal um, medical facility, right? A government entity. But that's the medical facility that natives use. And those are generally the medical facilities um, located on reservations. So they would meet the criteria. Um, we have a lot of nonprofits that are tribal affiliated because they're ran by native people and they provide cultural, you know, services, but they're not a tribal program. They're a nonprofit. So, and this was all designed with stakeholder input. So the eligibility is completely aligned with what the stakeholders wanted um, when this tool was designed. Next slide, please. Um, so these are example of questions, which I think Kelby is going to go over some of these later, but these will be some of the questions listed in the criteria. So if you're a direct service provider, if you're an indirect service provider, um, a law enforcement entity, government agencies, domestic sexual uh, assault tribal coalitions, coalition members, advocacies, um, other providers that serve American Indian Alaska Native victims and survivors are all going to meet the criteria for eligibility. And if you are ever 
you know, on the fence to where if you think you meet the criteria, shoot me an email and we'll walk you through it. Um, because if we can get you in there, if you serve, if you're going to be a service to American Indian Alaska Native victim or survivor, then we absolutely want to make you accessible to those folks. Um, I think with that being said, that comes to the end of the usage part, and I'm going to turn this back over to Kelby. Thank you. Thank you so much, Renee. And just a reminder to folks, if you have questions that you'd love our uh, team to answer from NCVC, uh, NCAI, or CLPI, make sure to include those in the Q&A box or in the chat function, and we'll make sure to answer those questions live here at the end of the webinar today. Now I'm going to turn over the presentation to Gwen evans Lomayesta. Uh, Gwen is a citizen of the Hopi tribe, and she's a researcher at the NCAI Policy Research Center. She received her bachelor's degree from Brown University in political science and international comparative policy. Her final undergraduate research paper analyzed jurisdictional conflicts highlighted by undocumented immigration across the U.S.-Mexico border through tribal lands. Gwen received her master's degree in public policy from King's College in London. Her dissertation explored the concepts of sovereignty and questions of limitation on expressed sovereignty. She held internships in the U.S. Senate and in the U.K. Cabinet Office. Gwen joined the Policy Research Center from the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine, where she worked on research related to global affairs and science policy. As a PRC researcher, she conducted research, she conducts research and data analysis on a broad range of issues to inform tribal policy and strategic priorities. And I would also like to add that Gwen was recently uh, became the chair elect of the National Census Information Center or Center's Network Steering Committee. So I'm going to repeat that again. She became the chair elect of the National Census Information Center Network Steering Committee, which is a pretty big deal. So we're really excited to have Gwen's wealth of experience, especially for detail in research. Um, Gwen's passion for this project is really unmatched, and she has done a great job putting together the first report, which was released just last week. Um, we'll make sure to include a link to the first report here in the chat box in just a few minutes. Um, Gwen's going to walk us through the first, second, and third reports, and I'm excited to see what other information she has to share with us. Thank you so much, and I'm going to turn it over to Gwen. Thanks. Thank you so much, Kelby. I love your introduction. Uh, could we please go to the next slide? There we go. Uh, again, hello. My name is Gwen evans Lomiesa. I'm the researcher with the NCAI Policy Research Center. I'm Hopi, and my family is from Shinnapwobi. Today, I'll be presenting an overview of NCAI's work, partnering with the Tribal Resource Tool, and I'll present the preliminary data from the tool. Next slide. NCAI's work on the project includes an analysis of victim assistance services for American Indian and Alaska Natives. We reviewed available literature and data and examined data from the Tribal Resource Tool. We're producing a three-part report series on our work, and it's shown on this slide. Uh, the first report is primarily a lot of what we'll be looking at today further as it establishes foundational data and the data needs for accessing services. Um, the second and third reports will cover, we will cover um, the data available from the tribal resource tool and about service providers participating in the tool. And we will take a preliminary look at the data used in those two reports today. They are the second report still is in the review process, and the third report is currently being worked on. Next slide. So first we'll discuss the current available data and literature. Next slide. The aims of the literature and available data review were to first review, review crime and victimization rates, except assess the I'm so sorry assess the availability of services needed services gaps in accessing services and to understand the barriers that prevent or deter access from services next slide <clears throat> here are some examples of data sets that were used in this review the literature was primarily focused on publications from the last 10 years but due to limited information available, some research does date back to the early 2000s. Next slide. 
So this is a NCAI Policy Research Center visualization of the crime victimization timeline. This will be referred to throughout the presentation. Next. Now, when I speak about crime rates, the data is collected at these stages of the crime victimization timeline. Crime rates measure the perpetrator, the crime, the type of crime that occurred. This is slightly different than victimization rates. Next which have overlap with crime rates, but measure the victim's experience. The rates are similar, but do measure different things, and this is why their numbers will differ. Next slide. Okay, so looking at crime rates, this chart shows all violent crime in the United States by year from 2007 to 2017. And this data is from the FBI crime report, Uniform Crime Reporting System. The chart includes some tribal data, but not all tribes submit data to the system, so detailed tables and crime rates cannot be calculated for American Indian and Alaska Natives as a group. Overall, we can see on this chart that there's been a decline in all violent crime offenses for the U.S. population between 2007 and 2017. Next slide. This chart shows the crime rate for all property crime in the United States for the same years, 2007 to 2017. Like violent crime rates, there's a steady decline over the 10-year period. Uh, the reason I'm showing again uh, the overall U.S. population rate is because there isn't data available to disaggregate down to American Indian and Alaska Natives as a group. Between the two charts, violent crime and property crime rates over the decade were generally on the decline. And, but however, this does represent our first gap in data because there isn't detailed data available for American Indian and Alaska Natives to measure at this point in the crime victimization timeline. Next slide. So now that we've looked at crime rates for the United States, we're going to look at victimization rates for the U.S. population and for American Indian and Alaska Natives, because there is some data available for American, American Indian and Alaska Native victimization rates. Starting with the U.S. victimization rates as a whole, from 2015 to 2017, there was a 17% increase in general victimization rates for the United States. So the crime rates are declining measured victimization rates are shown to be increasing. And the victimization rates do include unreported crimes, which are fundamentally not calculated in crime rates. Looking specifically at victimization rate data for American Indian and Alaska Natives, data from 2006 to 2010 showed that 39% of American Indian and Alaska Natives did not report violent crimes. However, using the same data source, but from 2008 to 2012, 37.6% of American Indian and Alaska Natives did report crimes to law enforcement. The variation in reporting and not reporting merits further investigation um, to better the data and increase understanding of American Indian and Alaska Native victimization rates. In order to better identify what services are needed, we need to fill this gap in identifying victimization rates further. Next slide. So this table shows victimization rates for American Indian and Alaska Natives, as well as non-Hispanic white-only individuals. And this data is from the National Intimate Partner and Sexual Violence Survey. The survey included a measure for any violence experienced over one's lifetime, and the top half of the table shows the data for women, and the bottom half of the table shows the data for men. This data reflects other research findings that the relative risk for violence experienced by American Indian and Alaska Native women and men is higher compared to non-Hispanic white-only individuals. Next slide. Available data on American Indian and Alaska Native crime and victimization identify these as growing crimes in Indian country. Additional data is needed to measure the impact of the growing crimes 
and the impact that they're having on American Indian and Alaska Natives and the level of need resulting from these crimes. Currently, there's limited data available uh, on these and represents another gap in knowledge that to appropriately identify and provide needed services. Next slide. All right, so we just looked at crime rates and victimization rates for the United States population and for American Indian and Alaska Natives. And we looked at where data gaps exist that if filled could help better identify needed services. Next. Now we're gonna look at available data on victim services and service providers. Next. This section focuses on the victim, the impact of a crime or the need resulting from a crime and the access to appropriate victim services. Victim services are public or private organizations that provide victims with the support and assistance that may be required for recovery. Next slide. The National Intimate Partner and Sexual Violence Survey measured the needs of survey respondents following crime. The top identified needs for both American Indian and Alaska Native men and women were medical care needs and legal services. American Indian and Alaska Native women are more likely to experience attacks including weapons, attacks resulting in injury, and attacks requiring medical care. Next. We can see in this chart how 38% of American Indian and Alaska Native women reported a need for medical services uh, compared to 16.6% .6 of their non-Hispanic white only counterparts. Keeping this in mind, next slide. Here we see the percentages of respondents who are unable to access needed services. 38% of American Indian and Alaska Native women were unable to access services. This isn't compared to 15% of non-Hispanic white only women who were unable to access services. Next slide. Mm -hmm. Barriers to accessing needed services for American Indian and Alaska Natives were looked into and discussed in the first NCAI report. Here are some barriers that are discussed in the first report, um, apologies, uh, that prevent or deter American Indian and Alaska Natives from accessing needed services. Gaps in the data for providing needed services are presented in crime rates, victimization rates, the types of needed services, and the ability to access services. Available literature and data shows the high risk the high victimization rate and the high need for victim services for American Indian and Alaska Native victims of crime. Next slide. After overviewing some of the available literature and data, we'll move on to a brief look at the data from the tribal resource tool that's discussed in the second and third report. If you'd like to know more about available literature and data, we encourage you to read the first report a link will be provided at the end of this portion of the presentation, as well as it'll be sent out to all registrants after the webinars conclude. Um, so now we'll look at the data from the tribal resource tool and the data from the second report set a baseline for comparison and was pulled on July 31st, 2019. And the data for the third report which compares a one year of change to the tribal resource tool was downloaded on July 31st, 2020. And these are the two data sets that we'll be looking at now. Next slide. So the data comes from the tribal resource tool intake form. Data presented does not include everything gathered from the form and data was limited to protect service providers and individuals intending to use or seek out services. Recruitment for victim service providers to participate in the tool continues to be ongoing. And it's important to remember that these are preliminary or first looks at data on participating service providers at two distinct points in time. The data cannot be used to indicate the spread of all available service providers in the United States for American Indian or Alaska Natives. 
and can only be used to analyze the tribal resource tools changes over time. Next slide. In the one year of change that the data sets measured, 544 additional service providers participated in entering their information into the tribal resource tool. The vetting and review process that Renee has covered uh, was standardized in early 2019, and the entire 2020 data set was vetted under the standardized process. In response to data gathered for the literature review and data review and for data that was produced from the second report, the Tribal Resource Tool partners expanded recruitment of allied practitioners between the 2019 and the 2020 data sets. Allied practitioners are practitioners who do not specifically focus on treating victims of crime, but they may encounter victims regularly in the course of their job. And a good example to understand what this means is if you think of emergency rooms or doctors, they regularly interact with victims, but that is not the sole focus of their job. The recruitment wasn't expanded because the tribal resource tool partners were struck by the high need of American Indian and Alaska Native victims and survivors for medical service and the high inability to access services. This is a key change between the two data sets and I find it a really exciting change because it's a change based on data. Next slide. All right, so this slide shows a side-by-side -side comparison of the 2019 participating service providers on the left and the 2020 service providers on the right. Um, so the pies show the percent of victim service providers serving specific geographic areas. Some serve nationally and others may only serve locally. This is important to understand as this impacts the scope and availability of services around the nation. Um, this was not a required question and the missing pie piece that you see on these charts uh, indicates the percent of participants who didn't answer this question. Next slide. So this slide again shows the 2019 service providers on the left and the 2020 on the right. Uh, and this is a side-by-side -side comparison of organization types of service providers participating in the tribal resource tool. In both charts, nonprofit organizations are the dominant service provider uh, participating in the tool, and these are followed by government-provided victim services. Now, it's important to remember that for these pie pieces, the agency types were grouped into these categories due to minimal representation in some categories such as tribal law enforcement, state and local law enforcement, medical services, and private organizations. So the nonprofit pieces include direct and indirect services. Government services include um, an option listed as government, as well as tribal government services. Uh, law enforcement category includes federal law enforcement, state and local law enforcement, and tribal law enforcement. Next slide. Here shows the variation in the length of time that service providers participating in the tribal resource tool have been established as an organization. Again, 2019 is on the left, 2020 is on the right. Uh, and in both data sets, this is interesting because most service providers participating in the tool have been established for 11 years or longer. Again, the missing piece in the 2020 data set refers to the percent of service providers participating in the tool that did not answer the question. Next slide. During the intake process, service providers were asked to identify crime types with specialized programming that they can offer services for. Service providers were given this list of the 24 different crime types and they could mark as many or as few as needed. The, this data is looked into in both reports two and three to show shifts or changes in crime types with specialized services participating in the tool over time. It's important to note that these definitions uh, for these crimes were formulated by stakeholder input to best serve the primary purpose of the tool, which again is not for research and the primary purpose is to serve 
American Indian and Alaska Native victims and participating service providers to match them together. This is not for comparative research. So this is why some definitions will vary from federal definitions in the report and in the tool. And this is why this data set cannot be compared to other data sets. This is important to know. Next slide. All right, so the tribal resource tool intake form similarly asks for victim service providers to indicate what kinds of services they can provide. The intake form this time offers 19 categories to choose from, and again, service providers can choose as many or as few services as needed. Between the 2019 and the 2020 data set, law enforcement was added as a category choice. The 2019 data set will not include this as a choice, and so it won't be included in the second report, but it will be in the third report. This is an important question for the tool because while an organization may provide specialized programming for crime type experience, it is equally important to be able to match the victim with the type of service that they need for their recovery. Next slide. Because the tribal resource tool was created specifically again to help American Indian Alaska Native victims and survivors of crime, like Bonnie explained yesterday, focus groups provided input into forming the tool and identified elements that might indicate a tr program is tribal or native specific. These are examples of some of the characteristics the intake form collected to understand how service providers connect to American Indian and Alaska Natives. Research does show that cultural elements in these programs do help with recovery of victims and survivors. Uh, so again, these are not all of the options listed in the intake form. These are some of the primary ones that were looked at by me in the two reports. Next slide. All right, so in summary for this section of the presentation, we looked at available literature and data that exists for American Indian and Alaska Native victims and survivors of crime. We identified a need for victim services for American Indian and Alaska Natives following crime. We looked at where the gaps in knowledge are and the gaps in data are along the crime victimization timeline. More data is needed to measure the need for victim services along the crime victimization timeline, as data really is helpful when petitioning uh, federal agencies, federal government, tribal government, to have those hard statistics to show the need. So the data is necessary and helpful in helping tribes move their services forward. So the data from the tribal resource tool gave us a first look at some available victims for American Indian and Alaska Natives in the tool. Next slide. The first report is available and you can get a copy through the NCAI Policy Research, page, Policy Research Center publication page. Uh, we will also be sending the copy out, I believe, after the webinars with all of the other resources. If you would like to get notifications on when the other two reports are through review and released to the public, you can join the NCAI Policy Research Center listserv by emailing research at ncai.org. And this includes my portion of the presentation. Thank you for your time, and I will pass this back over to Kelby. Thank you. Thanks so much, Gwen. I really appreciate it. Um, so if those of you who are keeping a log in the chat, we've included that fantastic link to the first report in the chat. As Gwen mentioned, uh, the team over at NCDC will be sending out all of our slides, all of the materials, and the recordings from day one and day two of the webinar to you. So in case you missed day one, don't worry about it. You can watch it at a later time. We have some fantastic information about why the tool was structured in the way it was. And then today we'll really continue focusing on the use of the tool as in, uh, in your backyard to be able to help victims of crime. Uh, right now I want to say uh, to, or I just want to move over to uh, our next portion of the presentation. Uh, if we can go to the next slide, please. I'm going to hand it over to Renee Bork to talk about the future of the tribal resource tool. Renee? Thank you, Kelby, and thank you so much, Gwen. I've learned so much about research from working with Gwen. It's just been amazing. 
Um, so yesterday you heard from all of the partners. You heard from myself, you heard from Gail Tome, you heard from Heather, Bonnie, Abby, Kelby, Gwen, um, about our outreach and the resources. And today you've heard about um, the exciting reports coming from NCAI, um, how the uh, tool is managed, the outreach, the inclusion. Um, and I think that we've come to the decision that this is a valuable tool to maintain. Um, and, you know, resource directories come and go, and that's usually due to funding stream. So OVC has previously assured us that they intend to maintain this project, um, keeping the information for American and Alaska Native victims and survivors alive on the website. Um, this week, we were actually advised by OVC that they are now exploring how to keep the tribal resource tool going um, beyond um, our funding stream, which ends again in December. So we will really be excited to um, hopefully hear some good information back from them and be able to pass that along and to maintain this and keep going. Um, again, I want to encourage you to get in the tool, um, look and see who, who you think should be in there, make sure you're in there. And we've had some questions about updates. So if anybody needs to update their information, by all means, feel free to contact us. We can do that with just a few keystrokes. So um, that's not, not a big deal. Um, I wanna thank you again for letting us take up your afternoon. I think we've completed the um, presentation portion and I'm gonna turn it back over to Kelby for Q&A. Okay, perfect. Uh, let's move on to the next slide and head into our Q&A section. And thank you so much to everybody who's been including questions in our Q&A section. Our team has been working really hard to answer those questions, or there's at least one that I saved because I, I'm not the right person to answer it, but our team uh, definitely has some people who are smarter than me that can answer some of these questions. Oh, and thank you so much to those people who sent individual questions in the chat as well. Um, so the first question that we have here is, I know that there's a service provider near my tribe, but I see that they're not in the tool. Um, believe me, I've been there. Um, when I first started using the tool a while back, my, my own tribe, the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma, has a plethora of resources, and I noticed a lot of them are not in the tool. Um, this person wants to know how they can get the, the service information for those resources near their tribe and put them into the tool. So this is a person not affiliated with their service, um, but they know that there are services in their community. I'm going to turn that question over to Renee, and so if you can talk about how people can help get more resources into the tool. Okay, so how we can get more is pretty much just like what we've been saying is um, word of mouth. There's, you know, we don't know all the resources available and the only way we're going to find those out is with your help. So I suggest everybody again to get in the tool, look and see who's there. We, there is a section for um, there on the main page where you can contact us and there is a section for feedback where you can send us suggestions or comments. So we can compile all of that into our report with our partners and also with the federal funders and with our um, senior management at the National Center as well. So Renee, what I'm hearing is if, if people don't, uh, if they see their resources, they can still reach out to you, let me know about the resources, and then we'll actually reach out to the programs individually. Is that right? Yes. I generally will send an Great. email, especially now. So if I, once mm -hmm. I get a notification that your um, program has been entered, I get an email notification. When I go to do my vetting process, um, I've will come to your program, I vet it, I approve it, and then once it goes live on the map, I generally will email you with the link and say, your program is live on the map, please check it for discrepancies. Um, welcome to the tool. <laughs> okay, fantastic, well, thank you so much. Um, let's look at another question that we got in the Q&A box. So this question will go over to Gwen, um, and probably our, our friends over at PLTI as well. And this question was, can the data that has been input into the tool be access for individual tribes? Uh, so the data that I received, I can't give out. Uh, really what I was given to was limited for the safety and security of, you know, the participating services and individual speaking services. So it's the data sets are not, that I receive are not publicly available, but again, I even receive limited data sets. 
Um, I would also add on to, to Gwen's point as well that, you know, the data that we receive in the tribal resource tool is very sensitive data. So, for example, we receive information about domestic violence shelters, and you don't want to publish, for example, the address of a domestic violence shelter, and so we make sure to keep that information closed, and so that's the reason it, it can't be shared out. And so that's, I'm being nods from my colleagues, so I, the answer is, I'm sorry, but it's really, it's really um, sensitive information, and so that information just isn't shared out, even on an individual tribal basis. Um, the next question I see here is, why is there no national data? Oh, it's, sorry. Sorry, right. I wanted something? to build off what you were saying. Oh, go ahead, Glenn. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, so um, kind of building off what Kelly said, too, about the data set. So the one that I use, at least for the tribal resource tool, it's not even um, disaggregated to specific locations or anything. Really, what I end up getting is at the state level and then in my report, I don't even look at it at the state level. I will look at it at a regional level that is closely modeled after the NCAI and uh, BIA regions. They're not exact matches, but um, it's even then we don't disaggregate it down to specific levels. Okay, perfect. Sorry. All right, well, Cal, well, we've already got, no, you're fine. Go ahead. I was just, just going to say, and yesterday we clarified that this was not a research study. Um, so with that being said, we weren't doing anything specific to any specific tribal nation. Um, because like we said, this, you know, victim services is not a one size fits all. So this was, you know, intended just to find gaps. Um, that's that's what the gap analysis was for, just to see where, which most of us may already know where we need services, but this kind of gives us that concrete information um, to hopefully mm -hmm. help somebody down the road, maybe with funding or something. Exactly, and you know, that's one of the great things about this tool being online, right, is that anyone can log in. So if a tribal leader was curious, what do we have around us, or a staff from a victim, victim service program, they can log in and see what's around them and it'll go within that 200 mile radius or whatever radius they're looking for. So that's really an asset to having this tool online. No, well, that's a great point, Heather. Um, so I want to make sure that we get through everybody's questions. There's a couple of additional ones. So what I'm seeing in terms of questions, the next one is um, for Gwen, I, I assume, uh, can data, yeah, well, hang on. Um, why is there no national data on American Indian Alaska Native crimes? Oh, that's a good question. Um, so what I ended up using for the national crime rates was from the FBI, FBI crime reporting system. And what ends up happening is a lot of that data has to be self-reported. And so while some tribes might actually report that, not all do. Also, tribes might have difficulty tracking their crime rates. And again, that uh, I believe it's covered in the first report, like that is representing a gap in even just having the basic ability to track these basic levels of data because it does take time and it takes resources that a lot of tribes may not have. So mm -hmm. that's a great question. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Gwen. Um, we've got another data focused question here as, as well. Um, it's why can't this data show or indicate what the spread of available victim services are for American Indian Alaska Natives? Um, doesn't it show that there are a lot of victim services available? Uh, no, so it doesn't necessarily. I mean, there is um, one of the important things to realize, especially when looking at victim services, is there is no gold standard, first of all, of what the spread of victim services are. So this is why we have to look along the entire crime victimization timeline, because we really like, we can identify, you know, I know that we need this type of service, but there may be other services that have been overlooked, or, you know, there could be this whole other level of crime that may not be as well known and you know the impact of it haven't been well studied people don't know necessarily that that also requires things so there's no gold standard of this is the exact spread of victim services that are required and then you also have the geographic spread every tribe may experience different crimes and they may experience different levels of different things so it really you know it's hard to compare this and then also our data set you know, like I covered a little bit, it, it cannot be compared to other data sets because 
uh, one of the big things we've run into is the difference in definition. Uh, you, you don't have a one-to-one -one comparative, and so that does prevent being able to compare these things. And then even within federal agencies, different federal agencies have different definitions for crimes and for what a service is. And sometimes even def different federal agencies use different definitions for what qualifies under the law or under the arrest as an American Indian or Alaska Native, as I'm sure Kelby can speak more to. But so there's so many different complicating factors that really prevent um, being able to show this or being indicative of what the spread is, because we don't know what the spread is. That's a good point, Gwen. Um, I also want to take us to the next question, which is for the entire panel. Um, and this is a repeat question that we had yesterday, and I, I was really excited to see it back again. Um, what can tribal nations do with this information? I'll turn it over to our, our colleagues at CLCI and NCDC to talk about the information in the tool, and then I'll turn it over to Gwen to talk about the information in the three reports. Heather, you want to go? I was like, uh, should we go? <laughs> um, yes, I mean, there, there's so much in the in, available in the tool, right? All of the all of the fields um, that are that we collect in the tribal inclusion form are so vital. What services are you looking for? Where are they? Uh, what type of crime is being experienced? And so. Um, as Renee outlined for us in the usage section, it really is a simple way for tribes to get in there, anyone to get in there um, and see what services are provided in their local area and having it online. I cannot stress enough. That's one of the strengths of having this tool be web based. Um, I'll turn it over to Renee for the rest. Well, and also, um, like you said, what what can tribes do? Um, I think it gives you the autonomy. It gives victims the autonomy to um, seek out services that they may or may not want. And we know sometimes in our tribal communities, confidentiality is a huge issue. Um, having this web-based tool that you can search at your leisure, um, I think helps with some of those issues that I know that I've, you know, come across serving victims myself. So, I mean, I think there's several, several, several areas that this could be helpful to tribes, but also the, going back to what Heather said earlier, if a tribal leader wanted to see maybe what another nation is doing, because I've heard they're being really successful over here with victims. So let me look and see what they've got. Well, what do we have? Because we know our tribal leaders, you know, they're busy running a nation. So they don't always have the time to know every single program. Um, so they have, you know, smart people in place to do that for them. Um, but this is a way for them also to see where other tribes may be thriving and give them ideas to also implement new programs and services for victims. I'll hop in with the data piece. So I think, um, or at least what my hope is, is that particularly tribes and tribal leaders and even tribal communities can take a look at these reports, maybe look at the data and understand how or like what kind of data they might need and they'll be able to collect it because I do see you know some people in the comments they feel lost and feel like they're not being counted and that's important because you you don't want to feel that way and it's so easy in this circumstance and you know it's really important and sometimes it does come down to the individual community to be able to look and be like okay this is what we need and particularly you know, again, for data, for funding formulas and such, if you can get, gather that data and know the kinds of data to need, that'll really help further funding, tribal governance, data and research additionally in your community. And so it really, hopefully, the data in these reports will help guide people in what might need to be gathered and for additional data that might need to be gathered for them. Okay. Great. Well, I just have um, one other question and then we'll start wrapping up here. So the last question I have, uh, when is for you, when will the next report be available? So we've already got report one out the door last week. I know that we've got two and three on deck. When do you see those coming out the door? Uh, hopefully soon. <laughs> um, so report two is in the process of review that could take a while. It could be quick. Who knows? Um, hopefully it'll be quick and in the next couple months, 
Uh, report two or report three is in the process of finishing being analyzed and then written. And so hopefully that'll be done on my own internal timeline, being written through ready for review in the next few weeks. But again, who knows with how long review processes take. So uh, hopefully we'll have them by the end of the year. That's the goal. Okay. Well, no, I I'm excited to see the rest of the reports. I know report one is you know it went through a lot of great reviews and had some great edits to it, and and report two and three I think is going to be even better. Um, I want to answer two other uh, quick questions, and then we'll move on. Uh, to, actually, if we can move to the next slide, I'll answer these questions as we're moving to the next slide. Um, so for those of you who already have a resource in the tribal resource tool, and maybe you've moved or you know, you changed email addresses or you changed phone numbers. If you want to update your particular tool, um, that's, you know, your particular resource, you can definitely email Renee. Um, she's the main point of contact. So if you want to email or email her and just say, hey, we've got a new victim specialist or we've got somebody new that's going to be the main point of contact. We want to make sure to keep all the resources in the tool as current as possible, but we can only do that if you let us know. Um, we're definitely doing some outreach to make sure that um, we're updating resources as, as uh, information becomes available, but making sure that your information inside the tool is the most up-to-date can really help us assure that victims and survivors in your community can find you and get access to your resources. Um, another quick question that I want to address is if you are a tribal citizen or you are a person that lives in a community and there is a resource and you have no relation to that resource, you can still let us know about that resource. Um, so feel, feel free to reach out to Gail, reach out to Renee. Their um, email addresses are here on the screen. Say, hey, this is the name of the resource in my community. I know they serve tribal people. Um, here's, their, you know, here's their website. We will reach out to them, especially if they're not in the tool, because our goal until December is get as many resources into this tool, make sure all of those resources are updated so it is useful for you and victims and survivors. So, don't worry if you're not the service provider, just tell us where they're at and we'll, we'll call them right away and see if we can get them into the tool to help people in your community. Now, with all that being said, I just want to say a couple of quick things and then I'm going to turn it over to Renee to close us out. Um, once again, uh, yep, okay, thank you so much for spending your afternoon with us. You know you could be anywhere but here, um, but you know it really makes us feel good about the, the work we're putting into this tool. We know that this tool is having a big impact in Indian country. We know that the reports are going to have a really great impact in Indian country. And we just want to say thank you for taking your time to help here. Um, we hope that this tool is useful for you to, you to find wraparound resources because we know that wraparound resources are really hard to find in Indian country. And the more resources you get out there, the more help that we can give people. So we just want to say thank you so much for taking your time. We'll see you again later. I'm going to turn it over to Renee because um, she might have some great words of wisdom before we head out. And thank you so much again. Renee? Thank you, Kelby. Um, and lastly, we're, we're out of time. So lastly, I just want to say thank you to our team. Um, we have a phenomenal team and I couldn't be happier to work alongside with all of y'all. Um, and I regret that Gail couldn't be here today and she also regretted that she couldn't be here today. Um, she's extremely passionate about this. So um, mm -hmm. we are glad that she is actually having a day off today. She deserved it. Um, so again, like Kelby said, thank you all for joining us today. And if you have any questions at all, my email is up here. Please feel free to email me. I had a lot of people yesterday contact me. I've been updating their programs all day today, getting information updated. And um, so that's, that's, like I said, easy with a few keystrokes. Um, that's all I really have today. I thank you again for uh, joining us. And if you're in the tool, thank you. And if you're not in the tool, please. Get in the tool. <laughs> Perfect. Okay, Mado. Take care, everyone. Bye.